Good morning, Jack. Have you got some time to talk with me about the source selection decision? Sure. Come on in and sit down. What's on your mind? Well, it's pretty obvious that the source selection decision is made by the official who has been designated in the source selection plan as a source selection authority, or SSA. But what's not obvious is how one goes about actually making that decision. I have just been designated the SSA for the first time in my career, and I need some guidance. You've come to the right place. Let's start by putting the source selection decision in the proper context of the acquisition universe. As we talked about in Source Selection 101, there are essentially two functions that have to be performed in any competitive negotiated acquisition. Proposal Evaluation and Source Selection. And remember the difference between Proposal Evaluation and Source Selection. Proposal Evaluation is the process of examining the merits of each proposal against the requirements of the solicitation and rating each factor and sub-factor identified in the solicitation based on the assessment of that merit. It is not a comparison of proposals, one against another. On the other hand, source selection is the process of comparing the evaluated merits of each proposal against those of the other proposals, using the established relative order of importance of the factors and sub-factors identified in the solicitation and selecting the proposal judge to represent the best value to the government. This is the SSA's job. In other words, selecting the proposal that offers the greatest promise of meeting the government's identified technical cost schedule and quality objectives for the contract? That's correct. The source selection decision is essentially a relative assessment of the risks of successful contract performance that are inherent in each competing offeror's proposal. I did some reading before I came to see you and noticed that FAR 15.101 talks about something called the best value continuum and a trade-off process versus a lowest price technically acceptable process. How do these terms relate to the source selection decision? FAR 15.101 is simply talking about the government's choice of what basic rule it will use to determine the winner of a particular competitive negotiated acquisition. In other words, what basis for award will be chosen? trade-off or lowest price technically acceptable. Lowest price technically acceptable is often referred to as LPTA. If the acquisition is using LPTA, the SSA's decision process is pretty simple. You look at all the proposals which have been evaluated as acceptable under the non-price factors and select the one with the lowest evaluated price. Unlike when trade-off is being used, under LPTA you have no discretion to consider whether one proposal's merit is better than another's in the non-price factors. All proposals are simply evaluated as either acceptable or unacceptable. In the non-price factors, nothing else. All the proposals that have been evaluated as acceptable in all the non-price factors must automatically be considered to be of equal merit to the government. That being the case, the one with the lowest evaluated price must be selected as representing the best value to the government. Under LPTA, the SSA has no discretion to choose other than the acceptable proposal with the lowest evaluated price as the winner. That sounds easy enough. It's sort of like a pass or fail grading system in school. The one who achieves a passing grade with the lowest price is the winner. That's correct. Okay, what about trade-off? How is that different? Well, the bad news is the decision process is more complex. But the good news is you have greater discretion to choose other than the lowest price or cost proposal as the winner. A trade-off basis for award can be defined as any basis for award, which states that factors in addition to price or cost will be considered in some relative order of importance to determine the winning proposal. So, while LPTA is like a pass-fail grading system in school, trade-off is more like an A through F grading system. But it's even a little more complicated than that. The highest grade does not always win, nor does the lowest price or cost always win. It really depends on the SSA's judgment and on the relative order of importance of the various evaluation factors, including price or cost, which the government has set forth in the solicitation. What do you mean? Well, suppose your evaluation factors set forth in the solicitation were technical, past performance, and price, in that order of importance. Suppose you were trying to make a selection decision between two offerers. Offeror A's proposal has received an outstanding rating in technical 
and a substantial confidence rating in past performance. Offerer B's proposal has received an acceptable rating in technical and a satisfactory confidence rating in past performance. However, Offerer A's proposed price is 20% higher than that of Offerer B. Because you are using a trade-off basis for award and the solicitation has stated that price has the least relative importance of the three evaluation factors, you do have the discretion, as the SSA, to decide that Offerer A's proposal represents the best value to the government, even though its proposal has a higher evaluated price. However, that decision must be based upon your judgment that the evaluated merits that explain why Offerer A's proposal achieved better technical and past performance ratings than Offerer B's are worth paying the 20% price premium that the government would have to pay to award the contract to Offerer A. What if I do not think Offerer A's better technical and past performance ratings are worth the 20% price premium the government would have to pay? Well, if that is the case, and again because you are using a trade-off basis for award, you do have the discretion as the SSA to decide that Offerer B's proposal represents the best value to the government, even though Offerer A's proposal has better technical and past performance ratings. However, this time, that decision must be based upon your judgment that the evaluated merits that explain why Offerer A's proposal achieved better technical and past performance ratings than Offerer B's are not worth paying the 20% premium the government would have to pay to award the contract to Offerer A. In light of the fact that the solicitation said price is the evaluation factor with the least relative importance, your judgment must encompass the reasons why you decided not to pay the premium. So in your example, the amount of premium I am willing to pay or not pay is a matter of judgment on my part, correct? That's right. And the exercise of that judgment can be dependent on many variables, such as the evaluation factors themselves, the relative order of importance of those evaluation factors, and the differences in the evaluated merits of the competing proposals. To give you another example, what if, leaving everything else the same, we now reverse the relative order of importance. Suppose the solicitation now says price, past performance, and technical, in that order. Wouldn't I probably choose Offerer B as the winner because now price has the most relative importance of the three factors? Yes. Under this new scenario, you certainly do have the discretion, as the SSA, to decide that Offerer B's proposal represents the best value to the government, even though Offerer A's proposal has better technical and past performance ratings. But that decision must still be based upon your judgment that the evaluated merits that explain why Offerer A's proposal achieved better technical and past performance ratings than Offerer B's are not worth paying the 20% premium the government would have to pay to award the contract to Offerer A. In light of the fact that price is now the evaluation factor with the most relative importance, explaining the reasons why you have decided not to pay the premium should be somewhat easier than under the previous scenario. However, because we are using trade-off, and even though price is now the most important evaluation factor, it is still possible for you to decide that Offerer A's proposal represents the best value to the government, even though its proposal has a higher evaluated price. Just as before, that decision must be based upon your judgment that the evaluated merits that explain why Offerer A's proposal achieved better technical and past performance ratings than Offerer B's are worth paying the 20% price premium the government would have to pay to award the contract to Offerer A. But in this scenario, your judgment must encompass the reasons why you decided to pay the 20% premium in spite of the fact that price is the evaluation factor with the most relative importance. Wow, using a trade-off basis for award makes the source selection decision very subjective. Absolutely right. Trade-off allows you to apply subjective judgment rather than an objective formula to choose the winning proposal. As the SSA, you have the discretion to determine which proposal offers the best chance of successfully meeting the solicitation's requirements and to decide whether advantageous aspects of a particular proposal are worth the extra money it may cost. Unlike LPTA, trade-off does not require that the lowest price or cost proposal must always win. The acquisition I've been appointed SSA for is definitely using a trade-off basis for award, so how should I approach my task of selecting the winner? You need to start by recognizing and understanding some basic parameters that govern every trade-off source selection decision. First, 
As we have just been discussing, the trade-off decision is a subjective judgment made by the SSA. Second, the SSA has broad discretion in making that judgment. Third, that judgment must have a rational basis. Fourth, the key is making a good judgment rather than the perfect decision. And fifth, while the SSA's discretion is broad, it is not unlimited. Subjective judgment with broad discretion. That's pretty powerful decision-making authority. Why does the SSA have such broad discretion? Because government officials are presumed to have the best knowledge of the government's needs, and it is the government that will have to bear the consequence of that decision. Okay, that makes sense. Now let me ask what you mean when you say the judgment must have a rational basis. That means that the decision must be based on what the lawyers call informed judgment. Informed judgment simply means that there must be specific, explicable, understandable reasons why the particular decision was made. If one proposal has higher adjectival ratings than all of the other proposals and the factors other than the price or cost, isn't that a rational basis for selecting that proposal? Not really. You cannot rely on adjectival ratings alone. These ratings are merely labels and cannot be the sole basis for your trade-off decision. You must look behind the adjectival ratings to identify, understand, and consider the substantive merits underlying and supporting these ratings. That is, the evaluation team findings, such as specific strengths, weaknesses, and deficiencies. You must also compare the substantive merits of competing proposals, identify differences in those comparative merits, and determine the significance of those differences. And all of this, as well as the decision itself, must incorporate the exercise of your own independent judgment. The combination of all these essentials is how you establish a rationale basis for your decision. In fact, the entire DOD source selection process is designed to make sure that you, as the SSA, have all the information necessary to make that informed judgment needed to select the winner. What happens if the unsuccessful offers don't agree with my judgment as to who should win? Aren't they going to protest my decision because it's so subjective? They may. But mere disagreement with your judgment is not enough for a successful protest. The burden will be on the protester to successfully show that your judgment had no rational basis. This is what the fourth parameter that I mentioned before is all about. The key is good judgment rather than the perfect decision. A good judgment is one that complies with all these basic parameters we all are talking about. As long as you do that, it won't matter whether everybody agrees with your decision or not. Our lawyers will be able to successfully defend your decision if it is protested. That is good to know. Since these basic parameters are so important, let me ask you about the last one. You said the SSA's broad discretion is not unlimited. What are the limits on that discretion? The limits are pretty simple. First, the decision must be consistent with the factors, subfactors, criteria, and relative order of importance, as expressed in the solicitation. Second, the decision must be supported by the rationale contained in the source selection decision document. In fact, FAR 15.308 specifically says, the source selection decision shall be documented, and the documentation shall include the rationale for any business judgments and trade-offs made or relied on by the SSA, including benefits associated with additional costs. Although the rationale for the selection decision must be documented, that documentation need not quantify the trade-offs that led to the decision. Thanks, those are some pretty well-defined limits. I cannot overemphasize the importance of complying with all of these parameters, especially the proper documentation of the decision. There is a recent trend on the part of both the GAO and the courts to give much closer scrutiny to the detailed aspects of an evaluation and source selection decision when looking to see if there is a rational basis supporting that decision. Do you have any advice for me regarding the best approach for ensuring that I comply with those parameters? Yes. The best approach is to follow a logical thought process that begins with you, as the SSA, making sure that you thoroughly understand the evaluation results. What do you mean? I mean that you must establish for yourself a clear and thorough understanding of what the SSEB, and if there is one, the SSAC is telling you in their reports and briefings. You must not limit yourself to just knowing what each proposal's adjectival ratings are for each factor and subfactor 
and what the total evaluated price or cost numbers are for each proposal. As we discussed earlier, you cannot rely on adjectival ratings alone. You must look behind those adjectival ratings to identify, understand, and consider the substantive merits underlying and supporting these ratings. In other words, what combination of evaluation team findings, such as specific strengths, weaknesses, and deficiencies, led the evaluation team to assign the adjectival rating it did and why. You must also know not only what the total evaluated price or cost numbers are, but how the evaluation team arrived at those numbers and why. Am I bound by what the SSEB and SSAC are telling me? What if I disagree with it? No. The SSA is not bound by the ratings, rankings, or recommendations provided by the SSEB or the SSAC. This is another aspect of the SSA's broad discretion. However, the SSA must always show in the decision documentation that the SSEB and SSAC input was considered and then explain the reasons for any differences. Okay, once I understand the evaluation results, what's next? Here's where your comparative analysis begins. You compare the substantive merits of all the competing proposals against each other. By substantive merits, I mean the evaluated strengths, weaknesses, deficiencies, and prices or costs. As you do this comparison, you are looking for and identifying the specific substantive differences in merit between those competing proposals. Must I do this comparative analysis for each factor and subfactor set forth in solicitation? That is correct. Once the identification of substantive differences in merit is complete, the next step in your thought process should be to determine the significance of those differences to your selection decision. In other words, how much weight or influence should you give each of those differences in your trade-off decision? You have to answer this question in light of, and consistent with, the relative order of importance of the factors and subfactors as expressed in the solicitation. For example, a substantive difference identified in the factor having the greatest relative importance should carry much more weight in your trade-off decision than a substantive difference identified in a factor having much less relative importance. What if there is a factor or subfactor where I do not find any substantive differences between two or more proposals? Or what if I do not consider the differences I find to be significant? No problem. Under either of those scenarios, you can simply make a determination, as the SSA, that the proposals in question are essentially equal in that particular factor or subfactor. But let me caution you not to get caught in a common mistake. Just because two proposals have the same adjectival rating in a particular factor does not mean that they are automatically essentially equal in that factor. Two proposals can have different strengths, weaknesses, or deficiencies in that particular factor and still have the same adjectival rating. However, those two proposals cannot be considered essentially equal unless you, as the SSA, determine that the substantive differences in merit between those proposals have no significance, and hence, for the purposes of your trade-off decision, the two proposals are essentially equal in that factor. That's a great caution. Thanks. Now, once I've identified the substantive differences and determined their significance, am I ready to make the decision? Yes. You are ready to exercise your own independent, informed judgment to make your trade-off decision and select the proposal that you judge to represent the best mix of price or cost benefits and non-price or cost benefits for the government. In other words, the proposal that represents the best value for the government. This is a decision that must be driven by your own independent, subjective judgment, not by a mathematical formula. Remember, FAR 15.308 specifically says, Although the rationale for the selection decision must be documented, the documentation need not quantify the trade-offs that led to the decision. As we discussed earlier, this is not a decision where the lowest cost must always win. This is a decision that must be driven by business judgments about trade-offs among the differences in the price or cost and non-price or cost merits of competing proposals to include considering the relative order of importance of the factors. The SSA is the person who determines whether the differences in non-price or cost merit are worth the differences in price or cost. 
So the last step in the thought process is to make the selection decision and document the reasoning for my decision, right? That's right. You must document the rationale for selecting the successful offeror in an independent, standalone source selection decision document, or SSDD. Thanks very much for the education and guidance, but I'd be lying to you if I said I wasn't a little nervous about this decision-making role. With the authority to exercise such broad discretion, I have a lot of responsibility on my shoulders. Don't worry. As long as you stay within the boundaries of those five parameters we discussed and follow the logical thought process we laid out, I have confidence that you will be able to make a good, well-informed business judgment that will withstand any scrutiny or challenge that it may get. Thank you for your confidence and support.